Welcome everybody to Organic Practices for School Gardens. Um, we're so glad that you've come out to join this webinar today. My name is Nick Lee. I'm the Senior Program Manager at the Edible Schoolyard, and I'm really excited to see all of you here joining us today. Um, I'm joined by a really special guest, Matt Sang, who is the Founder and Director of the Growing Leaders Program at Willard Middle School and Berkeley Technical Academy. Um, I'm really, really happy to have Matt here today to share some of the practices that he uses in his garden and how he teaches about sustainable farming practices and organic practices. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that we cultivate in Berkeley, California is unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone people. Um, if you know uh, or if you want to share a land acknowledgement for where you reside, please go ahead and do so in the chat. Um, if you're not familiar with the history of the place where you live or the indigenous people who have stewarded and continue to steward the land where you live, you may want to start by using the nativeland.ca uh, website to look up your location. We encourage you to explore the following resources around land acknowledgements and consider how you can engage your students in recognizing the lasting legacy of settler colonialism. Um, these resources will be shared in a follow-up email as well. Thank you to all of those of you who are sharing those acknowledgements of where you are calling from today. This is the second of three webinars um, that are all around our understanding organic curriculum. This is a really exciting curriculum that Raquel Vigil uh, designed. Um, Raquel is on the call today. Um, and we published this curriculum just back in August, and it is a curriculum designed for middle and high school students to support them to talk about organic, learn about the practices of organic, and consider what they can do to further the advancement of organic or access to organic within their community. Um, last week, we had a conversation between Raquel V. Heel and Wendy Johnson, who's also joining us on the call today. Hi, Wendy. And tomorrow, or sorry, next Thursday, next week, we're gonna have another conversation on taking action on organic. Today's webinar is all about organic practices. Um, the point of today is to talk about how organic management practices can support school gardens to grow thriving, bountiful gardens. Um, the purpose of today is also to talk about how we can teach the values and practices of organic to our students. Um, it's one thing for us to know them and to utilize them in maintaining our school gardens, and it's another to be able to teach those to our students. Um, thank you to everyone who registered and shared some of your goals in that uh, comment section as you registered. Uh, we had some folks say, I hope to learn new information about organic gardening and how to maintain a school garden using organic growing and natural practices. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do today. Someone else wrote, I want to learn how to better tend the school garden and engage students in the importance of growing organically and sustainably. And again, that lines up really neatly with our goals today. I wanna to also note that there was a few people who said things like, I want tips for starting a garden program, or I want to learn how to found a school garden. And that's a really important goal, and it's not going to be the focus of today's webinar. Um, we do have some resources that we really like that we're going to share in the chat right now. These are coming from Life Lab down at UC Santa Cruz in their program. And also, we are going to share a guide from the Office of the Superintendent of Education from DC and the School Garden Program in Washington, DC. They have a really wonderful guide on starting the school garden program. That said, we hope that you stick around and listen to this webinar and learn from all the educators on this call and from Matt uh, around how to organically care for your garden once you get it off the ground and growing. Um, all right, so I wanna say just a few more words about the understanding organic curriculum, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Matt. Um, the understanding organic curriculum is a series of 10 core lessons and 13 extension lessons. It is designed for, again, middle and high school students, although it can be adapted down to elementary and some to early childhood education, and it can be scaled to post-secondary education as well. Um, the lessons are written for educators and for students. Uh, the, the approach of the lesson plans is that they can be passed to students directly. They are addressing the students directly so that they can utilize them on their own as well. Um, it is developing critical thinking and textual analysis. 
skills and providing them hands-on opportunities to learn how to work in the garden. Um, one, one more thing is that it does come with a, a few preparatory lessons that are designed to get educators to think about what organic means to them and how they can host discussions um, that will elicit students' own understanding of what organic is before diving into explaining it. Uh, we'll share a little bit more on some of the specific lessons within that curriculum later, but right now I want to hand it off to Matt Sang, who, as I said, is the founder and director of the Growing Leaders Program at Willard Middle School and Berkeley Technical Academy in Berkeley, California. Um, and he's also, I, I just want to play up uh, all that he has done for the local school gardening movement. He's been a rock in the community. He's been teaching at Willard for almost 25 years now. And he has also served as a mentor to a host of uh, AmeriCorps youth, high school, high school students, interns, and he has just been, um, been so influential in advancing school gardening within the East Bay. So I just want to take a second to recognize Matt for that. And then I want to pass it off to, to Matt. Thank you, Matt, for being here. All right. Um, nice to see everyone. Um, uh, thank you to Nick and Edible Schoolyard for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I like these processes because it kind of causes you to reflect on your work. And oftentimes I feel like in our work, we're always kind of rushing around trying to get everything done. So this was a fun process for me to kind of think intentionally about, you know, what and why we do things. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll first I'll tell you a little bit about our program and then um, I'm going to first spend about the first 20 minutes uh, with some slides. All the slides are mainly pictures, so uh, there's not a lot of writing. It's mainly a sli old school slideshow, uh, so you can see the site and I can talk a little bit about our practices, our organic practices. Uh, and then at the end of that slideshow, I'll actually unshare my screen and then we can get some questions. So if you have questions while we're going through that, uh, put them in the chat and Nick can uh, keep track of them and then um, I'll answer those when I finish. After we answer those questions, I'm going to just stay on the screen like this and we're going to talk about some teaching techniques and what I like to think about when I'm teaching uh, about organics or about anything. And uh, at that point, you can type in the chat or you could also just come off mute and uh, when, when there's a gap, you can ask a question. Um, so really quickly, I teach in Berkeley, California. I teach at two places. One is Willen Middle School, which is one of the three public middle schools in Berkeley. Um, and I also work with high schoolers at Berkeley Technology Academy, which is our continuation school. Um, I've been working at Willard uh, since uh, 1997. Uh, I started out as an AmeriCorps member and as a garden teacher there. Uh, very quickly after I started there, we added a cooking program um, and then about eight years ago, um, so even long, longer ago, we started a, a summer employment program with youth. And then about eight or eight years ago, we started a business class. And so right now at the middle school, mainly what I do is I teach a business class where uh, students uh, grow, cook, and sell meals to the public. And uh, our model is they sell about 300 meals every other week. Um, and uh, the premise of the class is that the students are on equal footing with adults in terms of decision making. So um, we have democratic decisions on what we're making, uh, the price, um, and they are put in a position where they actually get to make those decisions and make mistakes. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can look at our, the program a bit. All right, can folks see, Nick, can you see my screen? It's good. All right. Yep, that's good. All right, so uh, the name of our program is Growing Leaders and it's at two schools. And you can see on the right, there's some chicken pot pies. Um, and the way people, uh, I'll just go through our program a little bit and then we'll talk about our organic practices. Um, so basically uh, we make meals for the school community and the way folks can actually order is they go to our website, which is growingleadersbayarea.com. So if you're local, you could order our meal. This is actually the meal that just got posted today and will be sold next Thursday. And so you see we're making a curry with basmati rice and we're making a chapatis. Um, but then we also make a lot of value added products. So you can see down there, there's granolas, there's apple turnovers, uh, salsa, uh, tomato sauce, applesauce. So, um, a lot of our focus is growing things for our value-added products. So we make a lot of pickles, 
Um, and throughout the season, uh, the students are coming up with different products that they might like to make. Okay, so this is a typical sort of meal that we would make, and then we always have value-added products uh, uh, next to it. And then in terms of the business, uh, we want to make it as, uh, you know, it's run by students, but also we want all the contact to be with students. So this is a typical meal day. Um, so next week, this will be happening. Uh, we sell our meals from uh, five to seven on Thursdays. Uh, it's all pre-ordered, so it's actually ordered on the website. And then as you walk in, you see there's middle schoolers there. They check you in on computers and then hand you your food and whatever add-ons you have. Um, and then, so if you look at our site, uh, we have two parts of our garden. So this is the middle school in, at, at Willard, and this is the main garden, so aerial view. Uh, this garden here is for mainly focused on growing for our classes. So we have our growing leaders classes, but we also teach sixth grade. Um, every sixth grade there in our school gets gardening and cooking. Uh, we rotate through their wheel class, which is like their elective class. Uh, so there is a life skills class and students come out for about seven or eight weeks in a row. Um, and so all the food that's grown there is really oriented toward teaching as well as to feeding the students. So either snack or through the, uh, in their cooking class. We also have another garden and that's the, we call it the Willow Pool Garden. And so there is a old public pool on site that was closed down about in 2010 and they filled it up with dirt and then the garden got blamed for it. And I got blamed for it for a number of years where I finally decided, well, I should start planting uh, plants in there. And so we did that kind of guerrilla gardening style for about a year. And then I talked with the city um, and they agreed that we could use that space. And our deal with them is that we'll use the space as long as um, they aren't using it and they just need to give us a couple of months uh, warning so we can get some of our uh, stuff out of there. Um, so the Willow Pool Garden, it was really nice to get this space. It's pretty large. Uh, there is a large regular swimming pool and a diving pool in there. Um, and basically this area enabled us to grow a lot for um, our business, our food business. So all like the tomato sauce and tomatillos, it's all grown in the garden. And then we also run a food pantry where we give away food. And so uh, you'll see some pictures of that later on. But this is also where all our food pantry um, uh, uh, produce is grown. Um, you can see some other uh, products here. Layla there on the left is pickling lemon cucumbers. Um, and this is one of our, uh, I think this might be a spring uh, plant sale where they're selling their products as well as plant starts. Um, so those are some of our high school interns. And this was in, uh, this was last year, uh, last spring. So in our COVID year, luckily we still got to work with our high schoolers in person. Um, just more of the products. Uh, partly why I'm showing these pictures is just to show you that, you know, we're trying to produce a lot in our garden. And so when we talk, start talking about the organic practices, you know, that's our focus is trying to, you know, produce as much food as possible in, in our limited space. Um, so we make a lot of tomato sauce, both to sell, but also we have a wood fire oven. So um, we make a lot of pizzas throughout the year. Um, so you can see the Romas on the left, and then we have a bunch of heirlooms, which are roasted off. Uh, and then they're milled um, and then we can it. So we have it for the rest of the year. Um, another product we started making last year that the students came up with is we had a lot of uh, butternut squash and kombuchas that we grew. And so we learned how to make uh, pasta. So this is butternut uh, squash uh, ravioli and uh, we freeze this. And then that's one of our products that we sell. So uh, this is uh, Diego and Jesse and they became expert. This is their this was the third time making pasta. Uh, we have an electric sheeter that they were using. So they tried to make the biggest one possible, which is pretty impressive. The other thing that we run at the high school, and this actually came out of the middle schoolers talking about, we were talking about our prices and how much we were charging. And some of the students said, hey, we're charging a lot for our food. And they didn't feel so good about that, right? And you know, our business is actually, in terms of profit before COVID was about $80,000 a year profit. Um, and so, you know, in some ways we're charging a premium for our food um, and some people can afford it. And our students were also feeling like their families, some of their families couldn't afford that food. So we also, they came up with the ideas, we wanna actually do something to serve our community. And so what we started doing two years ago was we started a food pantry. 
Um, so this is in front of the high school. You can see they actually decided to give away some of their products. So you can see there's some hot sauce there. But our goal is to, you know, produce high quality uh, organic produce for our community and give it away for free. We also partner with the local food pantry where we get a lot of the dry goods and other donations. But we're really trying to focus on trying to produce more, you know, culturally appropriate produce uh, for our food pantry. Um, this is a picture before the pandemic where we didn't have to, where it really was more like a farmer's market and people could pick their own food. So I put that in to remember those times. Uh, now we have to actually hand people their food or a lot of dry food is prepackaged. Um, so you can see through these slides, we're really focused on uh, tr trying to make our space as productive as possible. And so I'm gonna go through now to talk about some of our organic practices and what we do in order to, you know, focus on how we can produce a lot of food. Um, so our main organic practices on our site are compost and I'm, we're gonna go through you know, three of our composting systems. So one is a hot or aerobic compost system. We have a worm compost and then we have a long-term compost. Uh, we like to do a lot of cover cropping. Uh, so both in the winter and the summer, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the way we deal with a lot of sort of disease or pest control is through crop rotation. Um, we do want to bring in more beneficial insects, and then uh, we do a lot of propagation. So seed, uh, you know, direct seeding, as well as taking uh, cuttings or clones, and then we have started to do some seed saving. Um, as I go through there, like I, you know, I started in this garden, you know, over 20 years ago, and I started with only a couple garden beds. Um, obviously, from those, those pictures, you can see we have a lot of space. Um, but I also am cognizant that a lot of folks out there don't have as much space. So while I may talk about our processes, um, please ask questions if you have limited space and I'll try to also um, take some of what we do and, you know, and, and translate it for those of you who don't have as much space. Um, so the first composting system that we have is a warm compost system. Um, this has been here for a lot of years. We have a cool mural on the wall, and this is actually where one of our garden groups meets. So they're just old bathtubs that we got donated. Um, we drilled holes into those cast iron uh, bathtubs, and we have worms uh, in all three of those. Uh, they're bedded in newspaper. Um, and I would say we probably harvest in a good year, maybe three times out of those um, uh, worm bins. Uh, we keep, we store the worm castings. We use them a lot for worm tea. So we'll actually, um, uh, in 13 gallon buckets, make a big tea bag, soak them in there. And then we use that a lot on uh, watering our greenhouse plants, our um, new starts. And then we also uh, use it as foliar feed. So we'll put it in a spray bottle and spray it on the leaves. Um, and worms are, um, depending on the A6 graders love worms. And then uh, my junior, I mainly work with juniors and seniors and they're not as excited about worms. Um, so that's our first composting system. Um, our second composting system here is a, a hot compost, aerobic compost. So you see we have four bins here. Uh, the dimensions of this are about four by four. And we try to build one of these a week. So if you can see, they start on the right side where it says water there. So we just made a graphic there of all the things that we need in our compost. And we try to turn this once a week. It'll go, you know, after four weeks, it gets to the last bin. And then off to the left, you can't see it, but there's a big staging pile where it sits probably for another month. And then we have kids sift the compost and that goes into storage bins. We use this compost um, because it is hot pot hot compost, it does kill a lot of the seeds. So we'll, we'll use it in some of our transplant mix and definitely we'll amend our beds with it. Um, so for, for this, one of the things when we're thinking about compost is a lot of folks have compost. And what I always made a goal for us is actually to try to build a lot more compost, right? So I'm looking to build this once a week, have enough material to actually build a full four by four pile. Um, for some of us, that might be difficult, right? For a garden our size, we can actually do that. There's a lot of material, but I know for a lot of places that's actually difficult. So what I would suggest for folks is that making, you know, this is gonna be your main source of fertility and to do an assessment of either your site or your city and see where you can get extra, you know, green material or brown material. So one of the things I wanna show you, this is actually all current. I took all these pictures this week. 
um, we had a bunch of oranges in the, the morning breakfast. Um, so we grabbed those on site and we we're lucky that we have all of that. And you can see we have a lot of citrus and then we have a lot of plums from the after school class uh, for the after school snack program. So that all goes in there. Um, you know, in the past, I've gone over to the local grocery store and they've set aside boxes for me. We, we go to the cafe across the street and get coffee grounds. Uh, there used to be a brewery down the street and we got all their spent grain, right? Breweries use a lot of malts of grain. Uh, I got the malted grain first and I didn't know if it was a nitrogen source or a carbon source. I looked at it and it was like, it looks brown. So I built it with all brown and then a lot of our old lettuce and it turned out it's all nitrogen. So we turned a very stinky uh, pile. Um, so we learned very quickly that malted grain is actually a great source of nitrogen and you shouldn't mix it with other greens. Um, so. You know, I think in that that spirit of if you want to build more compost, you know, most of us are in relatively urban areas and there's st tons of places where you can divert that stream. Um, I would start at school because that would be the easiest one. Um, and, you know, back in the day when I was younger, I slept stuff from everywhere. I am definitely not as motivated to do that anymore. So I feel very fortunate that on site we have a pretty good stream of, of things we can use for our compost. Um, for a long time, I was really dogmatic that I wanted the hot aerobic compost. And this actually may have been inspired by Wendy Johnson, who spoke last week is in the audience, but you know, she was talking a lot about like leaf litter and oak leaves. Um, and so we started actually just making long-term piles. I was finding like so much of our stuff on site was being, you know, we put it into our city composting system, you know, stuff that was too woody that took too long to break down. But I was started feeling really bad about like all that stuff going off site. So we found places to start putting a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and what the benefit of that is, is you can put um, some of that woodier material and it will sit. This, this pile will probably sit for five to six months and we'll turn it and probably be usable by either the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Um, and we'll try to build a bunch of these piles. But what that enabled us to do was to go around the neighborhood in fall and collect a lot of leaves, right? Like trees are pulling some minerals that are because they're deeper rooted from deeper in the ground. And you're gonna get uh, you know, so, some more complete nutrition for your compost compared to what we're doing with a lot with the hot compost. So um, this has been really a nice change for us. And um, you know, under this pile right here, there's actually all these willow branches that from the willow tree that's right next door to this pile. So um, it's nice to have not having all this nutrition go off site. Um, so those are three composting. Um, Can I interrupt you before you move on to cover crops? Sure. There, there's a couple of great questions in the chat about compost. Um, like, how do you chop the materials? Uh, how do you have so much people power to collect all those compost materials? And what are some of the key points in building those compost systems? Um, if you could. So I think the lucky it. thing that we do, if you're working in a middle school, especially, is that you have high labor, right? So you want to look for things that are high labor, low cost. And so um, when we are building these piles, we will, let's say, like right now, we're pulling out all our tomato plants, which are quite large. Or actually, just yesterday, we took out all our uh, green bean plants. So we'll take that in a big pile near a tarp. We'll give students uh, head trimmers and they'll chop that up as small as possible. And that's a job that they really enjoy. Uh, on site, we'll always have either straw or leaves and another brown material. So um, all the ingredients are there and they are putting that into the, into the compost. Um, what, what was the, remind me the other questions, Nick? Um, let's see. Uh, Oh, I see the man. Uh, how, so in terms of people power to collect materials, um, we uh, on site, we actually have a green club. So sort of a ecology club. So they were they were tasked in the past of actually collecting all the compost from classrooms and bringing them out. So I think that's one way to look on site to see if you can leverage some of the actually student interest. Um, what I found was, was some of the businesses were actually really happy to get like, we had a Pete's coffee down the street and they didn't like dealing with all those coffee grounds. And so they were very happy to get rid of it. Um, it did mean an adult had to go pick it up, but there's often, you know, I think it's a great way to involve parents and other folks in your community to bring that on site. 
So thanks for taking those questions. Sure. Uh, I just saw this uh, cultural appropriate food. The way we did it was we actually surveyed at our food pantry. So at our food pantry, we asked folks what they would like to see. <laughs> And one of the things that actually happened is, you know, when you're depending on the food pantry for donations, you get a lot of like onions and celery and you don't get a lot of like fresh herbs and things like that. And so uh, we just did a survey and things like cilantro came up as super popular amongst, you know, many different types of cuisines are using cilantro. So we surveyed our customers. One of the things that we look at is our for-profit business, we think of them as customers, and then our nonprofit, where we're giving away, those are also our customers. So always doing surveys and figuring out, you know, what they would like. Um, the next way we deal with fertility is cover crop. So if you look at this picture, at the very bottom is some cabbage, but this was also taken this week. So we had a bunch of rain, and this is cover crop that we planted. It's mainly, um, it's a mix. It's one of those from Peaceful Valley, but it has a lot of vets, so bell beans. Um, some winter peas, and then they put in some winter wheat for more coverage. So this is about a week after being planted. This, if we do a good job of this, um, it should grow about four or five feet. And we usually cut this down in about April. Um, what I would say is I know for a lot of folks, uh, cover cropping isn't, um, you know, because you have a limited amount of space and it feels kind of hard to devote that space to cover cropping. So I understand that. I think if you can, try to at least do one bed. Um, summer cover cropping, depending on how, how it's going at your school, we run a summer program, so we actually have labor, but I know a lot of uh, places don't have a lot of labor in the summer. So actually putting some of your beds under, and depending where you live, if you can grow fall crops under summer crops actually is pretty nice. So if you use something like soybeans uh, as a legume, you can even, if you want a quick one doing buckwheat, um, but that's a nice way to have your bedy bed ready and fertile uh, when you come back in fall so you can plant your fall crop. So uh, I know that summer, uh, the winter cover cropping is sometimes hard for folks, but um, maybe consider doing some of that in the summer. Um, and then the final one in terms of thinking about fertility, this is activity we actually did this week. You can see at the bottom of this picture, there is a uh, diagram of the planting beds in the main garden. And so we talk a lot about crop rotation. So crop rotations to prevent disease, crop rotation in terms of different nutrients being pulled out of the soil. And so each one of those cards has a different crop with a description. And the students here are trying to put it in order for uh, nine, uh, nine cycles of planting. Um, and so each one has a little different information on it. So they get used to the concept. And then we actually involve our students. I involve some of our older students in actually coming up with our planting plan. So. Uh, we usually look at our planting plan, we usually have a record of maybe three or four years going back. And, you know, that's with a three season cycle. So we can get a sense of what we're doing. Again, right, we have a lot of space. So in a smaller garden where you only have one sunny bed, probably your tomatoes are going to go there every year. But I think then you can talk about like, what are some of the drawbacks with, you know, that you're, you're having and ask the kids, well, what are some of the solutions that we should be um, thinking of? Uh, last couple ones here, uh, you know, plant flowers uh, bring beauty, but they also bring a lot of the beneficials. This is a Tithonia, the Mexican sunflower. Um, we plant large uh, whole rows of beneficial things that attract benefit insects, but if you don't have that space, do it at the end of every bed, right? You can fill all at the end of every bed with some sort of uh, plant that's going to attract the insects that you want in the garden. Uh, the final couple of slides here, um, we have a greenhouse um, and we try to start uh, most of our stuff from seed or from clones, from cuttings. Um, and recently we started to, as a practice, to try to save more of our seed. Um, that is difficult, right? Because you do have to leave uh, plants in the ground for much longer, but things like, uh, things like beans and tomatoes um, and corn uh, are all really easy to um, save. And it's kind of a nice way to start, you know, producing plants that are perfectly um, suited for your uh, little microclimate. Um, this is just a cute picture. We harvested a bunch of prickly pears last week. Um, we actually got 24 quarts of juice, which is crazy. And only two kids poked themselves and honestly, they deserved it because they weren't listening. So um, I just wanted to put that there. 
And then um, I'll leave the slide up, but um, I might come back to this, but this is how we kind of look at our business uh, in terms of a, a, as part of the food system. So we're always trying to think about all these different parts of our food system. So let me stop sharing and then we can get some questions. And Matt, it looks like we got quite a few questions in the chat here. Um, Somebody's asking if you could share your system for recording crops over the years. Could you describe that briefly? And then if there's, you know, an Excel sheet or something, we can we can share it. Yeah, um, we actually just we uh, many years ago, probably like twelve years ago, I had one of my Americorps just sketch out the whole garden, and then we Xerox that. And usually, what we try to do is on one. So basically, we have a map of the garden with the beds, and they're all numbered. And we usually can fit about three seasons worth. So we'll just write the, you know, spring 2001 and what we planted. And so we can keep a record over time of what we planted there. Um, and again, like it's not perfect. And, you know, we have to have practical considerations all the time because of sun and space and all of that. And so um, I think it's a good practice just to know what you're doing, um, but understanding that we can't always rotate our crops perfectly. Um, the other thing that actually helped me a lot too, I think I went to Greenstring Farm, which is local, and they always would take their beds and actually move them. They're all movable. And, you know, we dump a lot. I don't know if you saw in the picture, we dump a lot of either hay or mulch on the paths. And so we've taken the practice of actually each year digging those paths up and actually throwing them back onto our beds. And so you're, you know, you're getting a lot of carbon um, through your pathways. And so uh, instead of moving the pathways, which seems nuts to me. Um, uh, we just take all that path material and throw it back onto our beds. Um, we got a question here asking if the cards for the crop rotations, are those something that you made? And if so, are, are they available? You know, I need to find out. We, we had those, we just did that, those cards um, last year. That was the way we uh, did it over Zoom was we actually made these cards. So let me let me find out and I can get that information to Nick. And we can oh, we didn't make the cards ourselves, but uh, let me find out like where that, um, if that's, if the actual descriptions on the cards are somewhere. Great, thank you. Um, does anybody wanna come off of mute and, and ask a question? Give a nice long pause there. I, I have a question. Um, but so my name is John. I'm uh, uh, zooming in from Boston. Um, and at, at my school in, in suburban Boston, we have a um, <clears throat> program that looks looks pretty similar to yours. We have we also have a lot of space and we have our set up like a um, like a small scale market garden with 50 foot beds and three and a half foot width beds. Um, my, I guess my question was about, um, it sounded like you're growing everything from or doing direct seeding or starting seedlings in a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, what, how do you deal with uh, watering those seedlings over weekends? Because our greenhouse is in the school building. And so it's completely inaccessible on weekends. And it's just maddening for us, especially since being in Boston, like we have to plant transplants. Direct seeding just doesn't work with the rhythm of the school year. Yeah, um, so we have access on the weekend. So a lot of times um, folks do come in, um, but that's actually a pain too. I mean, you can set up, so I have, we just moved our greenhouse, so that's a new greenhouse, but I have had um, them on timers and you can set that up. So if that, I would highly suggest that just in general, like, um, again, like over, over, overhead irrigation is that what you're suggesting yeah so you can get um there's a whole set like depending on what your greenhouse material is out you can actually if you have a beam going across you can actually put um either half inch or quarter inch with emitters there and they will cover um you know your whole greenhouse and it's a real easy and then it's actually pretty low cost and then you can get a simple battery timer that you would just attach to your hose bib um mm -hmm. that and i would highly suggest that just in general um because like, especially if you're in hot weather, like if someone forgets to, even during the week, like sometimes if someone forgets to hit the water, the greenhouse, like you can definitely lose a lot of seedlings. So I think just, it's a good practice in general to get that on a timer. Yeah, we've had a lot of mass die-offs and <laughs> they're so sad. Yeah, I know you spend all that time and then suddenly like 
you're two hours late yeah. on a hot day and like right. you just like a thousand plants <laughs> one person forgets once and that's yep. the end yeah yep. i've been that person multiple times <laughs> yeah all right good to know we're in good company yeah I i've got a question about your compost yeah uh, thanks for all this this is this is great stuff um my compost is not hot enough <laughs> what you just going 50 50 browns and greens like how how are you getting yeah. it up to above your or over 150 or how so, are you doing? yeah and that's like so we have a thermometer and honestly like the things that do it the best are manure um like when we i would go to stables and have just manure on hand and then uh something like coffee grounds are things that are going to heat up like I don't know if it's just like in terms of the greens that you're pulling out of the garden that you're not, you know, the percentage, right? Even if it's greens, who's know what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is, right? It might not be the right ratio. But, um, and then, you know, with manure, honestly, it's like there's so many microbes in there. So the way I look at manure is we get enough of it where we feel like we can inoculate the pile. Um, so I'm not layering it all with manure, but if you can find something like that or coffee grounds and see, um, that that's heating it up enough for you, then, then you should be able, you should be pretty good. But, um, how, how are you transporting your manure though? You have a truck or something? Yeah, I have a truck. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, apparently the zoo, we have a local zoo. I haven't accessed this. I don't know if folks at Edible have done it, but the zoo poo, and the, apparently they deliver. So, um, oh. I was going to call them up and find out. Um, so you know, stables, obviously, we all know about, but I had never, I don't even know what's coming from the Zupu. Like, is it lion? <laughs> like, who knows? Maybe that's going to make the most amazing compost. <laughs> and, then, and then you only have four bins, but you're building one every week. So does that mean that your compost only takes a month to... So basically, four, uh, we have four bins, we turn it every week, and then the last bin goes into a big pile. So it gets down to probably where the chunks are about that big. And then it sits in another pile for about a, uh, another month to a month and a half. And then from there we sift. And so whatever's broken down uh, gets used and then all the chunks get thrown back into the first pile. So probably from start to finish, it's maybe two to three months, but not everything's broken down, right? We just throw it through our, our, our bins again. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does that include the woody branches or? No, so the woody branches, so the hot compost, that one with like the four, that one we're turning every week. The hot, the long-term one, the one with the branches, I'll let that one sit for four or five months. So that's put, put in an area where it can just kind of hang out. Um, and then when we have enough labor or we remember, we'll turn it. Um, but I'm not expecting to get usable product out of that for right till the end of this year. Like, that pile that you saw, one was built in the beginning of this year when we moved it. And then the last, the next pile is one we're building right now. So if we get stuff in April and May, I'll be happy with it. And we'll sift through it too. And so all the big stuff just stays back into the pile. So it will break down eventually. Yeah, everything breaks down eventually. Thank you. Matt, we've got a question in the chat here about um, organic pesticides that don't damage plants. I know you talked about attracting beneficials with um, having lots of flowers, but but what do you what else do you do for pest management? The only thing that we've used has been neem oil, and honestly, like I don't oh neem oil, and then we've got used some like you know detergent, um, and that's mainly for like scale mealy mealy bugs and aphids. I feel like it's only been limitedly, you know, just because of the scale of it, it's only been limited effective. Honestly, the most effective thing is crop rotation. So we here in the Bay Area, we don't grow or at our school, we don't grow any greens um, when it gets warm. So we'll plant them now, have them through the winter, we'll do another flush. But once we get to April, like chard and and then brassicas don't go into our garden just because like we can't deal with the amount of aphids that start coming on them. So that's honestly how we deal with it. Um, it's been interesting. I've been trying to come up with a solution because I do want to have greens for a food pantry in the summertime. And so um, that's something that we haven't had to do before. But I like last year we started doing a little bit, but we were getting hit pretty, pretty hard with aphids. Um, I don't know if 
Wendy might have some suggestions with that. But yeah, in terms of like organic um, pesticides, like we haven't had much success or used much of those. Thanks for that. Any, any other questions at this moment? Yes, I actually have a question. Um, in regards to the farmer's market and the added value products, do the students have to take some sort of food handler's license or I don't know, some sort of certification? Yeah. So all of the adults have food manager's license and then um, all, my, all the teens have food handler's licenses. And then for the middle school as part of their, part of their class is learning about food safety. Um, so, you know, we still fall into a gray area. We have, you know, in, in the Bay Area, we have a couple different laws that allow you to sell a certain amount of food. Um, so we have like a cottage food law um, that enables you to do canned goods and stuff like that. But aside from the legality part, like that's part of us learning uh, how to run our business is basically all the food safety. Um, so um, all the students go through that and then any food that we're cooking for the public you might have noticed in in the um, in the pictures they're wearing hair nets and um, you know doing all kinds of doing all of that kind of stuff and then when the students um, process that transaction are the transactions mainly in cash or credit card uh, or it's all it's all online so basically if that's you, right yeah if you go to our website you can pay we have a shopify we use shopify as a plug-in um, so it plugs into your website and um, yeah, it's, it's pretty effective. It's pretty, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, interface that we use. Um, you. you know, Thank I would you. say once you get to that scale though, like it's, it's convenient, but it does take an adult or somebody whose job description is to deal with all of that stuff, right? Like, uh, and troubleshooting and all of that and dealing with customers. So um, I would encourage people to, stay small as long as possible and simple. All right, thank you. I noticed you have um, jams and things like that, fruit. Are yeah. you growing that fruit yourself? Yeah, so um, let's see, we have a lot, uh, so some, a lot of it we grow ourselves. So I would say what we can this year so far has been a lot of apple butter, uh, plum from our plum tree. Uh, we made grape jelly this year because we had all these grapes uh, that for some reason it didn't get eaten. A lot of them were, most of our grapes get eaten, but we had a lot left over. So we just threw those there. Um, and then this year we've been getting a lot of fruit from our after school program. So they get it and not all of it's eaten and there's no stream to deal with it. They're told that they can't give it away. Um, and so I go up and grab all of that and then uh, the kids decide what they want to do with it. Um, so they didn't like apple butter so much the first batch and now they're just making applesauce. Uh, and apparently even older kids love applesauce. But the, how do you deal with all the pests on uh, for apple trees? You don't spray, what do you, what do, you, you do with your spray, apple trees? I mean, you know, again, the high labor, right? So what we have is, yeah, you'll get wormholes, but it's mainly cosmetic and the kids, you know, when they process the food, they're cutting that stuff out. Um, and then we, we mill, we food mill everything. So in terms of like, we want high labor, we don't want too much high labor. So we cut, but we leave all the skins on. If they're good apples, we can leave that, you know, you can actually just throw them in almost whole. So you could cut them in half see if there's any insect damage and throw them in and then we food, food mill it. Um, we also have tons of folks in the neighborhood who always have too much fruit, right? And so over the years, we actually now know there's like three houses. Like we always go, like we just went last weekend to someone's pear tree and we always know we're going to get, you know, 50 pounds of pears from them. And then we have folks who've got a lot of lemon trees. So last year we started making a lot more, um, things like marmalade, which was pretty interesting to be able to do. So um, again, like if we are in, if you are in an urban area, there are stuff going to waste all the time. And just as the question is like, how can you balance that with not giving yourself more work? So if you can get that person to pick the stuff and bring it to you, um, you know, all the better. Matt, there's one question that's come up uh, in the chat here. Which is you, earlier you mentioned the the students will plan nine cycles of the crop rotation. Um, can you explain that? What's what's the significance of nine there? Or, or oh, it was that? just the number of cards, and <laughs> so for them it says nine seasons. But you know you can grow more than in a season. So it's, it's actually like you know it's like three three. If you have three seasons in a year, it might be like three years. So the only significant is we need an activity that would last fifteen minutes. 
<laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Very practical. There's nothing magic. I mean, nine is, is a magic number, obviously, but not in this. Book. Yeah. Um, I see we have a number of questions in the chat here. Um, people want to hear about coalition building and getting help from the neighborhood. And I also want to, to, to ask, what do you do to teach about organic? You, you've talked so much about these different strategies that you use in managing your garden. How are you talking about all of these practices with your students? Yeah, I mean, I think, and this is, you know, what, in my opinion, like the most important part, right? Like, I think a lot of times we're looking for the perfect curriculum or the perfect facts. And, you know, my experience, you know, obviously we're a garden and cooking program. Over the years, we've gotten funding from, like I started out as sustainable ag and then we were in nutrition. Um, and then now it's like CTE, career technical education. These are the hot things. And, you know, the whole time, even though I'm passionate, passionate about gardening and cooking, like our view is really like we're we're a kid oriented, a youth oriented organization. And so I think it's really important at the very base level to understand that. Like we're here to engage with, with kids. And the way you do that is by relationship building, right? There has to be some sort of connection before you can teach some somebody something. And I think oftentimes we skip over that because first of all, it's not so black and white, like how that happens. And it sometimes, it takes a while. And so for me, it the th that part is whenever things are going poorly and this still happens, right? Like, it's not like I figured, I've taught for a long time, but even, you know, the, a week ago, like I had an experience and I was like, oh, I'm so frustrated. Like this kid is driving me nuts. And I can always go back to understanding. It's like, oh, I haven't figured out how to build a relationship with the student. So I think that's really important just in the general sense. And I think sometimes we feel like, oh, if we have the right lesson or the facts or the truth, that somehow people are going to learn, right? And I think it's really apparent right, through this last period of time that we've gone through that facts and truth don't really matter, right? Like people are looking for connection, for community, for identity, right, to be seen and heard. And, you know, that's a human condition. That's what we're looking for. So until we have that, like, it's really hard for people to kind of take the information you're giving. Um, so one of the things like if so, you know, that's kind of like the, the ideology, the philosophy, but if we were thinking, uh, more so about like a lesson that we're teaching. Let's say we're gonna take these edible lessons. Um, I think it's really important to understand who your audience is and, and how you're gonna reach them. And one of the examples I always like to use is, you know, back in the day, they used to run these like, you know, don't, these non-smoking campaigns, right? And the big, the first ones, like, I think probably some of us remember was like somebody smoking out of their trachea, right? And there was this horrifying thing, it was very powerful. And what they found was those ads had zero effect on kids in terms of their smoking, right? Because it was trying to reach them at like, like scare them into being worried about their health. And if you've been around young people, like they're not really worried about their health at all, right? And so that as it turns of a social marketing campaign wasn't effective. What was effective was those ads that maybe folks remember later on was basically don't get duped by the man. Right, like these big nicot these big cigarette companies are trying to fool you as a young person, and it was more anti-establishment. It was like, and more developmentally appropriate, right, for a teenager who is looking for their own identity, who is looking to kind of uh, rail against authority. And so, I think it's really important for us to understand who our audience is, um, and to market basically our lessons to the folks in the room. The other thing that I think is also really important is to understand that we have a wide range of students. So while, you know, something like compost, I am really passionate about compost. I love compost. Like, I think it's a magical thing. And I thought, you know, so the first thing is be passionate. That's fine. Like, that's a genuine thing. If you are a, uh, like, if you are really into this thing, like, I think that's important not to temper that so much, but also understand that just because you're passionate about it doesn't mean somebody else is going to like jump on board. And so for something like um, the compost, there's many different forays into like figuring, you know, about that. Maybe the magical thing is some is somebody is interested in the science and I could, 
how does this rotting you know banana turn into this beautiful dirt in only two months that might be interesting um one of the kids might be fascinated by worms but honestly like a lot of my kids aren't fascinated by any of that right and so one thing so i, I did a couple of things one is it because i run a business class we started talking about inputs like we don't want to spend money on even if we wanted to buy like worm castings like how much do worm casting cost? They cost $20 a pound. How many pounds do we actually need, right? And so that was the area where they learned about compost, but it was coming from an economic perspective. Um, another perspective was actually humor. So I have a lesson that's called compost is money. And it's basically, it's a lesson surrounding why the adults in our room freak out when you throw your compost in the garbage, which invariably happens, right? We have this cooking class, and then like the cooking teacher will look over and just like freak out. And I was like, you know, like this is pretty ridiculous. Like you're someone just threw garbage into the garbage and someone's freaking out, right? And it's all surrounding like the humor of like, you know, and I always pick on one of the adults. It's like, why does this person freak out? And what I equate is like nutrients as money and those are nutrients. And so my lesson is all about, I get a stack of $20 bills and at the end I drop $20 bills into the garbage can one by one. And I make this big deal. I was like, I, I'm gonna do something. I want you to feel the emotions deep down inside what you're feeling. And this is what Suzanne, who's our cooking teacher is feeling when you put the apple core in. And I just like, I hold it high and I let it fall in there, right? And so that's the engagement, right? Suddenly they're getting engaged through this other way. So when we are thinking about our lessons, like. I try to think about like, okay, here are my constituents. I have a constituent who's in the worms. I have a constituent who loves the science. I have a constituent who is not interested in any of the environmental stuff and maybe interested in money, right? And how can I incorporate that into my lesson in order to basically capture each one of these, each one of the students? I love, love that image. I, I can see the kids just freaking out. Um... It was really great over Zoom. I did that over Zoom and they really couldn't, because usually I have a, a student that will actually jump out of a seat and run and try to grab the money. But over Zoom, it was really like, we could do that and we could take the camera and actually zoom it down into the garbage can and you could just see that $20 bill sitting on all the garbage. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Matt, there's, there's a ton of questions here for you about uh, engaging community, and, and I want to get to those, and I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about um, in, instructing on, on organic. Um, so I'm wondering if we could pivot for a second to talking about the understanding organic curriculum, and then we'll, we'll come back to those questions. Does that, does that work for you? Yep. Awesome. Um, so understand, the understanding organic curriculum that, that we just released has a series of lessons that are all about the practices of organic agriculture. Um, we have a lesson on propagation, a lesson on fertilization, a lesson on cultivation, and a lesson on uh, soil investigation. Um, and these are all kind of based off the, the understanding that Wendy talked about last week, that, that growers have really a few roles to support plant life. And that's, that's what we're doing as gardeners, as farmers, is we are supporting plant life and, and cultivating in that way. Um, and before we dive into those lessons, teaching those different skills, we actually highlight the values of organic. And I think that's, you know, part of Matt, what I was hearing you say is you gotta make it relevant. Um, you got to find the way that this, this thing has meaning for the students, because if you don't create meaning for them, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I think back to an experience just this year where we were, we were cultivating a bed, we were digging a bed and, you know, we're 15 minutes into this task. And one of the students goes, why are we doing this? And, and to me, that was like a, oh, that's a wake up moment of what I did earlier in this lesson did not set the student up to understand why this work is happening. Um, that we're cultivating because we need to loosen the soil to aerate it, to, you know, change the texture so that the plant's roots will have an easier time growing there. Um, but so, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that in, before we dive into these practices and teach the students about cultivation, um, we're, we're highlighting the values and the principles of organic. Uh, and we use the, um, the values of health, 
ecology, fairness, and care. And before we try to ascribe how those work in the garden, we actually have them, the students define those values for themselves. What do those values mean in their own lives? What do those values mean to themselves and to their family? And then we ask them to think about how that could apply to growing food. Um, so in these lessons, these, these four lessons that we have on organic practices, we, we have them start with a soil investigation. And I actually want to share this soil investigation uh, sheet with you because I think it's a great worksheet that was illustrated by, um, by our colleague Thais uh, Reyes. And here is our soil investigation sheet where students are actually looking close up at what sand, silt, and clay are and how these combine to create different soil textures. Um, and again, we're, we're asking students to look at this and consider what the soil is before talking about why we dig it, before we ask them to think about how we add to it to create fertility. Um, and again, I think this is just building that layered understanding in, in a sequence that helps make sense of the things that we do as growers, as gardeners. Um, the, the next visual that I want to share is a, a cover crop worksheet. Matt, you, you talked a lot about the, the benefits of cover crops. Um, and so when, when, we're, when we're doing this lesson on cover crops, we ask our students to complete this worksheet, which has them match these kind of different categories of cover crops of brassicas, legumes, grains, and grasses to the different benefits being provided. Um, and I don't know if it's hard to read on the screen share, but um, this one says suppresses weeds. This cover crop prevents weeds from growing. Loosen soil. The strong roots of this cover crop break up soil clumps. The other sheet of this is a guide. Um, did that sheet just move or are you still seeing the same sheet? Okay, that did move, great. And this guide, this reference chart describes that. So it gives them an understanding of what these, um, what these different cover crops do so that when they go out into the field to actually plant cover crops, they know that has meaning. They understand why they are doing that. Um, so those are just some of the lessons within the understanding organic curriculum that, that I wanted to, to highlight and, and share as ways of teaching about the practices of organic. Um, and we'll, we'll link to those lessons in, in a follow-up email and share those visuals with you so that you can use those. Um, and I, I want to give an opportunity to Raquel. Do you have anything you'd want to add about these these lessons at this moment? No, that's. I think that's great. You know, I I think I just want to answer. I think the question that just got put in the chat is really great about like how do you have time for these important conversations? Mm -hmm. Just the balancing of the sort of doing the garden work um, versus sort of the conversations or the kind of key learnings on different pieces. And I think that that's you know that is a that's sort of a difficult balance, right? I mean, I think that it's about practice. I think it's about also understanding the learning over a sequence of classes, possibly, depending upon your particular needs or, you know, and I think there's a lot of things that, you know, it just sort of, and even in the curriculum, really asking sort of a series of these noticing questions that are sort of precursors to even that kind of learning around the deeper meaning of like, what, what is the benefit of cover crops? But first having students just take the time and, and, and kind of informally have conversations about what do they notice? What do they see? I think that those kinds of things and referring back to those experiences can kind of build a knowledge over time, um, I think is really important. And good to remember that there's that balance um, and that it's just about sort of thinking maybe not it as your lesson or ways that you can kind of do that over time or, or sort of, um, uh, yeah, or, or find more sort of short engaging. And I think a lot of the time, especially around even, you know, teaching about the benefits of cover crop um, I think we do too much sometimes of so thinking about maybe there's one or two points that make sense within your context to teach to and you find different strategies to engage students around those. And that's something that you and I have talked about a lot, Raquel, and in, in the time of, you know, teaching remotely, we talked a lot about scaling down what we wanted or the takeaways to be for students. And I think that, you know, if the concept of cover crops can be, can be a lot, you know, it, it could be so much more than what we presented on that worksheet. But if the, if the takeaway for students is just, there are plants that make the soil better for other plants, 
that's that's the high line takeaway that you just need every student to have on what a cover crop does. Um, you know, going deeper than that is great. Adding layers to that is great, but that's that's the piece you want every student to walk away with. Um, so, and, and you know, just layering that on is is think about what is what is the one sentence version that you want every student to understand about what they're doing, and then just make sure that they have that. Um, yeah, and and then I yeah, Matt, you brought up a really important point, right? It's like differentiating, like based upon students' interests, right? So there's different ways that you could teach to, you know, find activities that you know appeal to certain students and their curiosity around certain aspects of what you're teaching. So there's different ways to sort of enter into sort of what may feel like the more, you know, kind of formalized instruction um, of, of sort of these strategies, but finding different ways to engage your audience to sort of emphasize that. Um, I'm noticing it, it is five o'clock right now and we're scheduled to go till 5.30 and I'm noticing in the chat that there's a couple of people who have to head out at this moment. I want to take just a quick pause to share a few other announcements and to share um, a survey link and to share a sign up link for next week's webinar and then we'll turn back to Q&A with our remaining probably 25 minutes then. I know a lot of you have more questions that you'd like to ask Matt and we can discuss some of those other questions that we didn't get to yet. Um, other announcements, uh, I want to take a second to highlight that the Growing School Gardens Summit has been announced for April uh, 22nd to 25th in 2022. That's going to be held in Denver, and that's being hosted by the School Garden Support Organization Network and the Sprouts Healthy Community Foundation. Um, Registration is open right now, and they have a call for talks open at the moment and proposals are due November 4th. Um, we have a link for that in the chat if you're interested in attending or uh, proposing a talk for that conference. Um, also coming to us from the School Garden Support Organization Network, uh, the University of Texas Austin is running a research survey on school garden sustainability. Uh, there's a nationwide survey where they're asking school garden programs to respond, sharing some information about your program, and they are going to publish kind of a best practices for school garden sustainability for long-term um, financial health of school garden projects. So if you're interested in participating, uh, check out that link and they will in the springtime after they've concluded that study actually write back with some of their, sharing some of their findings and also offering personalized recommendations based on your responses. Um, the final event that I wanna highlight that's happening this week is hosted by the Community Alliance with Family Farmers, or CAF, um, and that is the sixth annual California Crunch. Uh, the Crunch is an opportunity for a statewide celebration of local food, and it uh, used to happen all at one time across the state. This week they're doing it uh, across this entire week, but it's an opportunity for students, educators, uh, food service professionals to share a bite of local food simultaneously and uh, highlight that on social media. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can sign up and uh, Yusef over at CAF will, will get in touch with you with more information on it. Um, so again, for those of you who have to move on with your day, thank you so much for coming out. Um, and we're gonna pop a survey link in the chat. The survey is really quick, should take just about three minutes and that will give us some useful feedback, help us design future sessions. Um, we really appreciate you taking a moment to share your input. Um, as I said earlier, we have another webinar next Thursday. And that's going to be on taking action on organic. And we'll talk about the final project from this understanding organic curriculum that is a uh, action project in which students are prompted to consider how they can support organic or support access to organic within their community. Um, and I think that's all that I want to say right now, other than a big thank you to Matt Tseng uh, for coming out and, and sharing so much knowledge and wisdom and uh, great stories and photos of, of your program at Growing Leaders. Um, and then again, thanks for coming out, everybody. And if you want to stick around for Q&A, we'll, we'll kick that off right now. So come off of mute if you've got a question you're dying to ask. And if not, I'll read a few seconds. I'll read some questions from the chat in just a second.
Okay. Um, so Matt, a question that we have a few different versions of from earlier is, what does it look like to build support and coalitions amongst school staff and parents? What challenges or barriers do you commonly face um, in building support and how have you approached it? So how do you have the entire Willard School community behind you? Because you do, and it's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel pretty fortunate where we are now. I would say when I started, I didn't have any support. Um, I was mainly looked at as a problem, right? Because, you know, I think school gardens are, I mean, it's not the case anymore, but they were just looked at as a place where things got more and more dirty, right? So the VP didn't really like it. Um, the custodians didn't like it. So, yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things like, I think taking a long-term view and um, kind of leveraging the champions that you do have, right? So finding either supportive, you know, I, I wanted to get, I was, we were a sixth grade program when we first started and I wanted to get into the older kids. And so I talked to a science teacher and we raised chickens because she was doing animal development, right? So then I, I was working closely with this teacher and so she became a champion of mine. She was like, oh yeah, this is a great type of program. Um, we feed people, right? Like that's a really easy way to, so we started hosting like the first staff meeting out in the garden and we'd have something for them to eat. Um, you know, a big part of the community is a lot of communities don't know what's happening in your school. So like so figuring out how to get community members into your garden um, is really great, right? So we have a plant sale that does that, but having some sort of events actually where you're bringing the community members in there. But, you know, I, I think, it, it is a, like right now, like I have tons and tons of support, but it wasn't always like that. So I think taking the long term view, um, I would, you know, my view with whatever I've done, you know, all the programs I run in the school are pretty non traditional. And so I never wanted to argue with anyone to kind of like convince them. So my view was always like, let me find a couple people who want to work together, let's do it. And then we have the evidence that it worked as opposed to trying to prove it to somebody by arguing. So that's been my philosophy over all those years. It's like, I'm gonna figure out who I can work with. I'm gonna do it myself. And then I have evidence where then it's undeniable, right? Um, so, yeah. That's great. And, and that evidence is the kids showing up after school, wanting to participate, wanting to give their time, wanting to be involved. So, I love that. Um, I, I wanna note, uh, also that Wendy, Wendy Johnson is on this call as well. Um, Wendy, were there any questions from earlier about some of the organic growing practices that you're, you're dying to, to add on to? So I know you have 50 years of farming knowledge and are just a incredible resource just, here. Just noting that's only double what Matt's given to Willard. What a beautiful show. I mean, there's a perfect example of what you were just talking about today with the pool garden people were griping and grousing you somehow you figured out how to do it now you have this whole adjunct garden which is more than adjunct it's just a whole new world it's it's very exciting and just the honoring your long-term commitment to the school and to to learning on the on the right on the front edge it's just beautiful very inspiring program thank you um i do there were a couple of points you asked me to interact like growing greens in the summer that is really a big issue, um, especially for those of us in very, very dry uh, situation like we were this year in California up until a few days ago. So a couple of things that, that I think are helpful. This is where, because you're so connected to the community and you have students who, who have different, different gardens probably at home. So sometimes you can say, hey, does anyone have a shadier, cooler place where there's, you're able to grow and you haven't been growing? So suddenly you're growing, uh, you know, near the a couple of blocks from school, you're, you're able to grow some chard, you're able to grow some kale, you're able to grow some spinach. And, you know, also looking for varieties that do well in a hotter climate. Just today, I was at the farmer's market and cornered Andrew from Full Belly Farm to say, how do you keep spinach growing at this quality, given the drought we've been facing? And he told me about a really unusual variety called space. I thought that was a weird name. Anyway, space from Johnny's selected seed. And I saw the, the spinach. So I thought, okay, 
so that you, you ask your good farmers like um, like Andrew from Full Belly Farm, what varieties will stand the kind of heat we've been facing? So I think that there's innovation possibilities that way. Love it that you're doing long-term composting. You know, ideally a good school garden, a good garden anywhere, about a third of it, if a third of it's in perennial crops, that's really helpful, but that means woody debris. That means exactly what you're dealing with. Cut, I, I know you said it, but but cutting into small pieces and young people love to chop, cut, saw, do anything they can to break, you know, to stomp, whatever it takes to have a long-term composting. And then to, to um, just admire that long, slow round of decay. You know, we always thought, I remember at King asking kids at the end of a year, what, will you, what do you remember the most about the gardening year? And we think, oh, they're gonna talk about the chickens. But I remember one student saying what I remember most about King is coming into the garden in the winter when it was freezing cold and just looking at the steam coming off the compost pile and thinking about that. We were so surprised that this rambunctious kid would choose that particular feature of long-term compost is slow pile, slow rot, nice, sweet steam rising up. Um, Matt, I wanted to <clears throat> ask you to talk more about the plant sales, because I know plant sales are just a wonderful opportunity for students to interact directly with the public. And then how did you do the plant sales during the pandemic? So is that okay to ask you to do, to go yeah. over that one? Hope it's not yeah, a so, diversion. Um, yeah, we've run the, I don't know how long we've done a plant sale, but it's been a, a lot of years. And so we generally do starts and then we actually serve food. Um, and usually it was wood fire pizza and we recruited Nick to come over and, and cook a lot of those pizzas because I didn't want to cook the pizzas during the plant sale, you know, preventing me from schmoozing. Um, but yeah, so, you, you know, I think it's interesting, like that was actually one of the ways that we developed most, the most support for our program because we were getting community members who didn't have kids at our school, right? They were neighbors or they were just walking by or they're from campus and they're like, oh, I want to eat pizza or like, I want to plant my one little tomato plant. So you know, ostensibly, right, it was a fundraiser, but actually, like, I think the effect of that was more building that community to support, and people, like, would walk in and, like, meet us and meet the other kids, so, you know, I think the value in those type of things is actually more, more about community building than about actually any money that you're making, um, and it's also a really nice way for students to start interacting with adults. In terms of the pandemic, we had to do, you know, kind of just, so we, in the pandemic, we actually use the, our, um, basically what we use to sell the meals as a way to actually, people would pre-order their, their plants and then we have them set out um, and they would come at a certain time uh, and pick up their plants. And what we found was with yeah. the large garden, we actually didn't have to worry about that. So when we did it again, um, we just kind of said like, um, you know, set everything out and people could come and kind of, you know, they could socially distance in the garden. But yeah, um, yeah those, those things are wonderful. They're really, you know, such a, such, I feel like they're so important to the community. And when we didn't have it, like the community felt it. The other thing we did was we always make sure that we have city compost. So, you know, here where we are, we could get city compost for free and we have that on site. So uh, gardeners can come and just get all the compost they want. We set up buckets and wheelbarrows. And that was another way to get folks who, might not want to come and buy anything, but also just come on campus, right? And so giving stuff away for free was also like a really nice way to do it. Beautiful. May I just say that one more thing I noticed, um, Nick, when Nick and Raquel talked about the um, organic values, how you transfer values and focusing on health, ecology, fairness, and care, right away I thought, because I took notes on what you were saying, Matt, anyway, I thought, those values, your graphic fits perfectly with those values. So you look at gardening, community, business, labor, cooking, and the environment, and each one of those categories goes immediately to health, ecology, fairness, and care. In fact, there's even duplication. So it was very exciting to see how adaptive and um, what a good fit this curriculum is for um, learning on, on the front line. Yeah, and I've been appreciative, you know, with our you know, we've talked about like with our business, like a triple bottom line, right? Like there's the profit, but also like, what are we doing for our environment? What are we doing for our community? And that really was right. coming from the students. 
you know, like, that's like the food pantry came from the students. So like, I think that's the other thing that I really appreciate that I think that stuff actually really speaks to young people and they have that lens that they're looking at things. So I, yeah, I appreciate, you know, those words because I know that they actually are engaging for students. Great. Now we've got a question here um, from Tasha. Where do you get cheese flour for those pizzas funding? Do you have dairy animals? <laughs> we don't have dairy animals though. I have so many AmeriCorps who always just like, can we get goats? And I was like, well, if you want to come every day on, and on the weekend, right? We don't even have to like water the greenhouse. You're going to have to uh, milk the goats. Um, yeah, we, so, in, so now we just buy it because we have a, you know, we have money to, to buy stuff. In the past, um, yeah, I would go and go to the local, either a grocery store or even, you know, the local mill. Like we were lucky to have a couple mills at our local and just call and they were happy to donate a 50 pound bag of, of flour. So um, that kind of stuff is actually relatively easy to get. It's just, you have to spend a little bit of time, but uh, again, if you're living in an urban area, there are always those type of resources. So uh, don't be afraid to ask. And then don't be afraid to ask your school community as well. Thanks for that, Matt. Anybody have any other questions? Again, I encourage you to come off of mute and, and ask away. I have a, a nuts and bolts question. I did already ask one, so I don't want to hijack the, the Q&A session. Please, John. Um, thanks. Uh, so Matt, you'd said, uh, so you guys are doing meal prep and value added products and you're doing it at a pretty large scale um, and I'm just curious if you had or have encountered any um, like licensing issues where you have to like with the the state um, department of agriculture get a get a manufacturing license because they would probably consider what you're doing manufacturing um, so I was just curious if you encountered any of those obstacles when you get so big you get on the radar of certain agencies? Yeah, we haven't. Um, we've tried to stay off the radar. And um, honestly, like I think it's a little bit balanced out by how much just community support that we have, right? So any of those kind of regulatory agencies, they're pretty strapped and we are not the first folks that they will go, uh, you know, kind of go, go and find. Uh, that being said, like where we are starting to go is, um, yeah, I've had to be more official and above board. And we actually have both um, our kitchen at the middle school is being remodeled and will be more updated. And then I have a kitchen being built at the high school at the continuation high school. So, you know, as we've gotten bigger, like I've had to learn more about that area. But, um, you know, so far, knock on wood, we've been we've been fortunate with that. Um, but yeah, it, it is this balance of like how efficient, how big you want to be. And I do think it's an area that we're going to go more and more toward. Uh, but as of right now, um, in our development uh, part of our life, like we've been pretty fortunate with that. And I, I think that's in part because you're, you're completing the best practices for what would be a licensed business, right? As you said, all of your adults have the food manager safety certificate and all of your students have a food handler certificate. Um, you know, you're doing everything in the way that it, it would be certified. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's a big part of it as well. Um, and, and just on that note, I'll say in, in my experience, having students earn their food handlers certificate feels like it would be a chore, but, and, and it can be, um, but it's also something that they get a lot of pride from. Um, in my experience, the, the students feel, feel a great sense of accomplishment from earning something that is a you know, a professional certificate that is needed to work in the industry. It's the real thing. Uh, it's not something that's just a, a test for school. It's a, it's a test that gets them something recognized by the state. So yeah, a tangible skill. Yeah. Yeah. It, do you guys do serve safe or what, which yeah. agents do? You, yeah. And Matt, we got a chat question here. Uh, would love to hear more about your dreams for the future. Uh, long-term thinking, what are some fun ideas that you're hoping to build on? And thanks, Kirk and Audrey, for that question. Um, I have all kinds of ideas. So uh, one of our, our big ideas for the high schoolers is that I want them to um, start making uh, frozen food, like frozen entrees to give away at the food pantry. Um, so um, 
And so figuring out how to do that. And that, you know, I think that's kind of what John's question is like, that's a little bit, obviously we're giving it away. So it's a little bit different, but you know, more above board. So blast chiller, uh, figuring out like, you know, can we source, you know, leftovers from different places and can we turn them into delicious food that's easy for families to warm up? So um, I'm excited about that. And then for profit, uh, Nick knows I love pizza. Uh, I recently bought a propane pizza. You know, we, we do wood fire pizza at, at school. It's kind of a pain to have to manage fire. Uh, there's all these amazing propane pizza ovens. So I have one of those and I want to get two and have high schoolers run their own pizza business and then Chinese dumplings are, are also. So in terms of for-profit, those two and then non-profit, figuring out how to make healthful frozen entrees uh, that we can give away. That's awesome. And I'm, I'm always down to come over and cook pizzas, Matt. You know that. I don't mind tending the fire. Um, it looks like we've got one question here in the chat. In chemical fertilizers, there's usually the NPK concentration shown on the bag. Do you consider this in organic gardening also? Yeah, I mean, NPK is just the nutrients, right? So um, those can be found in synthetics and they can also be found in natural sources. So, you know, if you look at bone meal or bet, you know, blood meal, you're gonna get um, those percentages on there as well. So those are, regardless of whether they're synthetic or organic. Awesome. Any other questions for Matt, for, for Wendy, for Raquel about the curriculum, for me? Uh, yes, I actually have a question for Matt. Um, I saw someone asked it earlier in the chat and maybe I missed him answering it, but um, can you go over the irrigation in the bed and maybe how wide the beds are and the emitter spacing? and the half inch poly and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So most of our beds are, as you said, half inch poly and they're a foot apart. And I think they might be gallon emitters in those in an hour. Um, so in the pool garden, because it's mainly high schoolers, like, and actually those beds are getting wider. Like I'm trying to get them to about four feet. Um, just because it's like larger people there and and I just want to kind of use more space. In the actual garden where there's a lot more of our middle schoolers, we're going probably at most three feet and some of them are smaller. And so we'll have two lines in there. Um, and then on the four foot ones, we'll put three lines in there. Um, the ones in the main garden are, uh, they're attached to rigid PVC which actually we ran underground. And so we have valve boxes and running un underground. Uh, the stuff in the pool, because we wanted to go just kind of kind of fast and dirty and fast, it's, it's all above ground and it's all half inch poly. Um, as we go along, we may change that. And we actually have the diving pools not under irrigation right now. It's all hand watered, which is a super big pain. And I feel like we're just growing a, uh, bindweed, which Wendy, I would love to get a solution because I'm basically a bindweed farmer right now, I feel like. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's 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 kind of what we use on both. Um, yeah, I think once you get to a larger scale, like doing, doing irrigation like that um, is really useful. So. How wide are your walkways? Um, in the main, so basically what I did, so <laughs> in the pool, I want it to be four feet uh, four feet beds, two feet uh, walkways. And I, I kind of just had, you know, a, a, a kid go down with the wheelbarrows. Uh, in the main garden, it might almost be equal sometimes. It might be three foot and three foot. Um, so I think you kind of have to determine like how your garden is used. Like, do you want two kids walking, you know, by each other? And if you do, you probably need three feet. And if you don't, then you're going to make it smaller. But I also would say like, be real. Like I like to take a permaculture approach to kids. Kids are water. So you think you can control them with your design. You can't actually control them. Like I tried for many years by putting like a puntia, like, you know, really spiky cactus in a certain area and they just destroyed it. So like there should be some sort of, when you're looking, if, if you have kids going from the PE class to their classroom and it goes through the garden, unless you can put a really big barrier, their water and they're gonna go through that. So you're gonna to have to design uh, your permaculture around uh, your students. Um, 
So yeah, I would say probably three feet and kids can go by each other. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, sure. This has been just, just an incredible session. I'm, I'm so glad we got to hear from you today and to, to learn that I'm not the only one who's a bindweed farmer. Um, and I, I just appreciate you so much and, and for sharing so generously about the work that you do and sharing so many inspiring stories. Um, again, we're gonna pop a survey link in the chat. Uh, if you could take just a minute to, to reply to that survey, we'd greatly appreciate that. Um, and then I just encourage everyone to come off of mute and say a quick goodbye and uh, a thank you to Matt. Um, thank you to Wendy for being here again. Thank you, Raquel. And thanks to Aaron for running tech today. Um, but again, come off mute, say, uh, see you later, say a good evening. And uh, thanks again to Matt. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you this so much, wonderful. Matt. Thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Matt. You thank you, Matt. Oh, thanks, Matt. Keep it going. This is amazing. Yeah, this is fantastic. <laughs> I would love more of this. Thank you.